I'm Susan Euler. This program is about Roman clothing, which is a lot more complicated than simply wrapping a bed sheet around your body. In the 21st century, people all over the world dress pretty much the same. Known as the Western style of dress, the style includes a pair of pants, usually blue jeans or khakis, combined with a top, shirt, or blouse, often a simple t-shirt. Both men and women dress this way, although women still have the option of wearing a dress or a skirt instead of pants. In cold weather, a coat, jacket, or vest, sometimes all three, is added to this basic ensemble. This ubiquitous style of dress came into fashion for men's clothing in the early 19th century and has actually changed very little in over 200 years. And while there are still plenty of regional and traditional styles worn, more and more these styles are being abandoned in favor of the pants and shirt combination, especially in the West. Traditional styles are now seen mainly at special occasions and events. The ancient world wasn't like that. Men and women dressed differently from one another, and the rich dressed very differently from the poor. Regional styles, national styles, were worn every day, not just for special occasions, because they were seen as an essential part of proclaiming one's cultural identity, as well as one's profession and social class. And national styles were very distinctive and very different from one another, as these illustrations of foreign diplomats from the tomb of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses III show. And even if a person, such as a diplomat, lived in a foreign country for many, many years, he or she continued to wear the national dress, because how you dressed demonstrated who you were and what you believed in. This is still done today, although to a lesser extent. And sometimes, again like today, so-called foreign styles were imitated and copied, eventually changing the traditional ways of dressing when they represented a clear advantage. For example, the Romans, who for centuries fought wearing short skirts and sandals, eventually adopted the trousers and boots of their enemies, the Parthians and the Celts, because trousers and boots were much better suited to the harsh conditions of combat than bare legs and sandals. Of all the ancient clothing styles, none are more familiar to us today than those of the ancient Romans, or so we think. In modern times, actually for many centuries, Roman toga parties have been an extremely popular way of having a drunken good time. And it's not just limited to college campuses. This painting by Caravaggio entitled Bacchus was done in 1595. It depicts not the Roman god of wine Bacchus, but a young, Renaissance-era Italian man dressed up in a bedsheet at a toga party. But did the ancient Romans really dress in white bedsheets? In a word, no, they did not. Did they wear togas? Yes. It was their national costume, the badge of Roman citizenship, a way of proclaiming their identity. But the toga was only worn for special occasions. It was not always white and it was not what most Romans wore on a daily basis. So if not the toga, what did the Romans wear every day? Well, that garment was the tunica, what we still call a tunic. The basic tunic was very simple to make and served as both an undergarment and an outer garment. It could be sleeveless or have short sleeves, much like a t-shirt. In fact, it was a t-shirt, only it was longer usually reaching to the knees when belted. Made of linen or light wool, children and ordinary working men and women wore tunics as their basic outer garment because it was practical, roomy, and comfortable to work in. The tunic was also the basic uniform of the Roman soldier. Dyed red, it was worn plain during work details and leisure time and under armor for parades and battles. Lots of real tunics still exist to show exactly how they were made. The people who died at Pompeii during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD were all wearing tunics, and many Roman Egyptians were buried in tunics. Most tunics were plain, with maybe some simple decoration around the neck. Those found in Egyptian tombs, however, tend to be more elaborate. This is because they date from the later period of the Roman Empire, when lavishly colored and embroidered tunics, called tunica maticata, were in fashion. The more simple tunics worn by upper-class men during earlier periods were white, 
and had reddish purple stripes running down from the shoulders. These stripes were called clavi. The broader the stripe, the more high ranking the man. Very high ranking men wore what were called broad stripes. In the military, a broad stripe officer was one who earned his commission through wealth and influence rather than because of his excellence as a commander. To be called a broad stripe tribune was a criticism. A tunic with broad stripes is called a tunica laticlava. Like today, Roman clothing styles changed greatly over the centuries. By the second century AD, the long sleeve tunic became popular with men, something that would have been unthinkable a hundred years earlier during the reign of Augustus Caesar, when men who wore long sleeves were thought of as being somewhat less than manly. And other tunic-like garments also began to be worn, such as this caftan style called a dalmatica, shown here in an early Christian catacomb painting. The Dalmatica got its name from Dalmatia, a region in today's Croatia. It's also the area where the Dalmatian dog comes from. In any case, the Dalmatica, or Dalmatic, is still widely used as a vestment in the Christian church, and it still looks very much like it did in late Roman times, down to the full sleeves and bands of lavish decoration. In fact, nearly all of modern Christian liturgical garments have their origins in the clothing styles of the late Roman Empire. Besides the tunic, Romans also wore the amitcus. The toga fits into this category. Unlike the tunic, which was cut into shape and sewn together, an amitcus was simply a large piece of cloth that was draped, folded, and sometimes pinned into place. Today, we would call this type of garment a shawl, veil, or scarf. For example, the basic woman's dress in ancient Rome, called a stola, was really not a dress at all but a piece of cloth that was pinned at the shoulders by fibula, ancient safety pins, and belted at the waist to give it those nice folds, which incidentally look a lot better in artwork than they do in real life. Well, okay, now let's get back to the toga. Now, if you were an ancient Roman upper-class man, you would be getting dressed for the day in a toga, thanks to Julius Caesar, who made the toga the official garment of the Roman citizen, mainly because he liked the way he looked in one. In any event, I'm not saying that making all his colleagues walk around in heavy and comfortable togas is what led to his assassination, but it didn't help. The imperial Roman toga was described by one Roman senator as not a garment, but a burden. It was a hated item of clothing, made of wool, six yards long and two yards wide, which is an amazing amount of fabric. It had to be held in place by gravity, since it was only draped and folded together, never pinned or sewn. And no man could dress himself in a toga. No, he had to have help, a servant, a friend, his wife. And it would slip off the shoulders and trip up the wearer constantly. Those togas you see in movies aren't real togas because people can actually move and walk around in them. Real togas, as depicted in Roman sculpture, show men hanging on to them for dear life. So, after centuries of struggle, although they never lost their designation as the official badge of the Roman citizen, Togas got smaller and smaller and were eventually replaced, even by the emperor at state occasions, with more practical clothing. For the 10 Minute Professor, this is Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in and make sure you subscribe to the Susan Euler channel. I've got a lot more videos just like this one.